Thank you very much. They're shutting the doors. Uh, that's a good cue that it's time to start. So we'll go ahead and get this kicked off. First of all, welcome to reInvent. Uh, thank you very much for coming by and uh, coming to the AWS conference in general. And again, to this specific session. This is going to be a fun session. It's a, um, an opportunity for us to share with a partner some of the ways that we found other partners have had success with in-app purchasing. So what we're going to cover is how the top 50 apps in the Amazon App Store did with in-app purchasing compared to the rest of us. Now, I say the rest of us because personally my apps are not in the top 50. If any of you have apps in the top 50, I'm sorry, please excuse me, but I will still be referring to everyone else as the rest of us. Um, that being said, we'll take a look at how they did differently and then what they did that they almost all did, that very few of the rest of us did, that may account for some of the differences. Then we'll take a look at uh, Salim from Playtica, Division of Caesars Interactive, and we'll take a look at what they've done with this data and additional things that they've learned to help them really profit from in-app purchasing. So, to get started, I'd like to pre-answer the question, what does Amazon care about in-app purchasing? Well, you know we have an app store, and our app store is available on all Android devices. It's available, of course, on all the Amazon devices, like the tablets, the Kindle Fire, the Fire TV, the Fire Stick, uh, the Fire Phone, of course. And it's also the default app store now on all BlackBerry 10 devices. The app store is available in 236 countries and territories worldwide. So if we can help our developers do better with in-app purchasing, that could really help move the needle for them. That could really make a big difference. So we have a lot of interest in helping our developers do better with in-app purchasing. So we kind of wanted to know why some games did really well with in-app purchasing, and other games, which are really good games, by the way, actually didn't make that much. What was the difference? What did the top 50 do that the rest of us didn't do? So we did what Amazon is really good at doing. We started gathering data. We did a cohort analysis. Now, a cohort analysis is a fancy way of saying we took 100 users from each of the top 50 apps. We took 100 users from uh, the rest of our apps, similar but not top 50 apps. And we normalized the data so that we could take a look at it uh, all from a, the single install date and actually do a comparison uh, of apples to apples. So, the first data point in our install is, well, how many people actually installed the app? Of course, because we ran the study to measure 100 and 100, we've got 100 uh, for the top 50 and 100 for the rest of us. Now, later on day one, we find that the active users is just about half of the total people who've installed it. So of all the people who install it, just a little bit more than half actually start to use the application. It's Odd, but interesting. And it actually makes sense that, well, then you're going to have some uninstalls on day one, too. I mean, if you don't use it, why not uninstall it? Much more interesting than uninstalls, though, how many people actually start paying on day one? What we found on the Amazon App Store is that roughly 3% of people who install an app will start becoming paying customers on that day, on day one. So we see about a 3% pay rate for the top 50 and a 3% pay rate for the rest of us. Now, this data up here on the top part of the chart, I'm gonna call retention data. I'm gonna refer to this data as the retention data. And right now, it's pretty statistically even between the top 50 and the rest of us. But what we wanted to do was get a little bit deeper dive into how those users behave inside the app. So we took a look at how they spend time in the app. We've got three pie charts up here. Uh, the pie chart on the left is session length. So the average session length for the top 50 is 7.4 minutes. For the rest of us, it's 6.9 minutes. The next pie chart is the number of sessions that an active user will have in a given day, in this case, day one. So we'll see almost three sessions per user for the top 50 apps, about two and a half sessions per user on the rest of us. And if we do the math, and we multiply the number of sessions by the session length, we have total session length. In other words, 22 minutes per day are spent in the top 50 apps per user, about 18 minutes for the rest of us. 
That's pretty interesting to see how they spend time in the app. But I'd also really like to see, since we're talking about in-app purchasing, how they spend in the app. So the bar charts will get to that information. The first chart here represents the number of items that a user will buy. Now, we've normalized this to the rest of us. We took the apps that the rest of us have, and we normalized that at 100%, so we could see the delta between 100% our apps and the top 50. So in this particular case, the top 50 sell 12% more items than we do. And they also sell those items for a 36% higher price. Wow, okay, that's cool. Now, do the math with me. And you'll find that the average price per paying user, the average revenue per paying user, ARPU, is 54% higher on day one for the top 50 <coughs> apps than it is for our apps. What does day two look like? Day two, we still have a roughly statistically even group of data up there in the retention data. And the average session length, things will start to creep in favor of the top 50 a little bit. But take a look at the monetization, the bar charts there. That middle bar chart, the average selling price, the margin has gone down for the top 50. And it's not because the top 50 did anything wrong. It's actually because we did stuff better. We actually sold a larger percentage of our catalog that had higher price points in it. So we actually closed the gap by doing better. They still have an advantage, which still results after you do the math in about a 14% increase in average revenue per paying user. But we did better. How about day three? Day three, retention data stays fairly the same. The numbers on average minutes and, and total session minutes still creeps in favor of the top 50. And they're also making inroads on items sold and purchase price per item. Right. A week later, there start, we start to see more significant differences in the retention. This is about a 25% retention advantage for the top 50. We see the advantages for the top 50 continue in terms of session minutes and session count. And as long as they're spending more time in the game, they're buying more things and they're also buying them for a continued higher price. One week is really kind of a tipping point where we see the top 50 start doing a lot better. So two weeks later, uh, take a look at retention. Now that's a 40% advantage for the top 50. And a month later, it's a 100% advantage for the top 50 in terms of retention. And take a look at the total session minutes that people are spending in the game. A lot of that is being driven by a larger number of sessions per day. Now, the number of items that people are buying isn't a huge amount greater. That number hasn't really changed over the course of the month. But now look at the advantage that the top 50 have in terms of price per item. Again, and that builds up to a 31% increase in average revenue per paying user that just keeps on going a month out and later. Now, I understand that a lot of the uh, material that's out there says, listen, I lose 80% of my users after day seven. Why would I care about two weeks, one month, and later if I'm talking about such a small percentage of my users? As a matter of fact, um, when Salim got to play Tika, uh, he, he got the same information, that really what matters is seven, seven days, and the longer tail didn't really make that much difference. But what we discovered when we were doing the study was a little bit different. So let's take a look at purchases by hour. Obviously, the first 24 hours is important, no doubt about that. You'll get about 18% of your revenue from the first 24 hours. But take a look at how long that tail is. And that isn't even you know, a month worth of tail. Uh, seven days, 168 hours, about halfway down the chart. Um, we still have a whole lot of tail left to go. As a matter of fact, 74% of the revenue that you're gonna get will happen after 168 hours, or after seven days. A little more than half your revenue you're gonna get after 30 days. And that's really important to focus on those users because the price that users will pay <clears throat> for an in-app purchase item increases over time. What we found in our survey, uh, in our study, was that users who have been in the app for 30 days or longer will pay 60% more for an in-app purchase item than they will on day one. This is why having 
users and items tailored to users who are in your game seven days, 30 days and later is really very important to monetizing inside your application. So after we did this very numbers intensive drill down into the apps in our app store, what did we learn? Well, we learned that the top 50 apps can sell more things for a higher price. All right. I know, guys, it's not rocket science. If you could sell more things for a higher price, you'd probably be in the top 52, right? So the, the takeaway from this is how did they do that? We know how they did, but what did they do to get that difference? We'll talk about what they did differently in a little bit. The other thing I'd like you to take away from this data is that it's not just the retention data that matters. The number of sessions that a user has in a day and the number of minutes they spend in each session is also a really important metric. And we'll get back to that in just a little bit. But now I'd like to take a look at what the top 50 did differently than the rest of us to generate that kind of revenue, that price per item. First of all, the top 50 app developers know these numbers. They live and breathe these numbers. They get that 64% of the revenue they're going to get is going to come from someone's third or later order. If you don't think that the top 50 are specializing the offers they make to people who have made three orders or more, well, trust me, they do. They make specialized offers for people in that category. They know that 74% of their users are going to come after seven days. They know that after 30 days, they've still got half the revenue left on the table. And since people are paying more after 30 days, trust me, the top 50 are differentiating the offers they show those customers than customers who are in the door at day zero. They know that they need to give uh, uses a reason to come back for that reason, but they also need to make it really easy to come back because 48% of repeat purchases are going to happen within an hour. Now, I know I just showed you a whole bunch of slides that said the average session length is about seven and a half minutes. So if you're wondering where this whole hour thing comes from, that's a fair question. Actually, the, the, the second purchase, the subsequent purchase, happens in a subsequent session. So it's a user who's used the app, logged out, and then within an hour logs back in and makes that, sub that, makes that subsequent purchase. So if your apps aren't easy to re-enter quickly and simply, you may be leaving some of that money on the table. Lastly, the top 50 developers know that 37% of the users who will ever buy anything buy something on day one. To that end, the top 50 have optimized how to sell on day one by including in-app purchasing in their tutorials. As a matter of fact, when we looked at the top 50 apps versus the rest of us, what we found was that apps that included a discussion of in-app purchasing in their tutorial had 2.5 times greater conversion than apps that didn't. Now, after you teach somebody how to buy something, well, it kind of makes sense to teach them how to use it, don't you think? A lot of our apps don't do that. You can buy an in-app purchase in our apps, and we just say thank you. We don't even show you how to use it. Well, we could be leaving a lot of money on the table, not to mention frustrating users. I mean, if they don't know how to use what they just bought, why would they ever buy anything again? What we found in the research that we did was that if you teach users how to use what they've just purchased, you will get 65% more orders than if you don't. OK, that seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Now, if you're going to teach people how to buy things and teach them how to use what you've just sold them, you've got to have stuff to sell them. And this is where inventory and selection makes a big difference. We took a look at how inventory plays a part in total revenue. And we normalize on 6 to 10 items so that we can see the differences. And if you have 11 to 15 items in your catalog, you're going to make 45% more than you will if you only have 6 to 10 items in your catalog. Now, this doesn't mean that if you've got 1 to 5 items in your catalog, all you have to do is add 10 more items to an in-app purchase dialog, and you'll be in the top 50. Um, it doesn't actually work like that. They don't show any more items per in-app purchase dialog than the rest of us do. They keep it nice and tidy. They keep it all on one page. There's nothing below the fold that you have to scroll to get to. What they're doing with that catalog is offering different items to different users so they get the right user at the right time. They're showing a portion of that catalog to users at day one and another part of that catalog to users at day 30. The depth of catalog they have gives them the flexibility to do that. 
So having that variety is really important so that users don't just see the same items day after day after day for a month. But while variety is really good for catalog items, variety is not so good for prices. Now, it's not the case that there are bad prices. $3.99 isn't somehow an evil price, and if you have it, you lose money. It doesn't work like that either. What it does tell you, though, is that when users see a whole bunch of similar items with very, very close price points, it's increasingly hard for the user to figure out what the value is of the higher price point item. Now, a confused user doesn't buy the most expensive thing in your catalog. Actually, a confused user doesn't buy the least expensive thing in your catalog. A confused user doesn't buy anything. So if you have too many price points and it's hard to determine the value differentiation between those price points, you're losing customers. They're getting frustrated and they're leaving. So the key here is it's all about being clear about the value. Now, here's an in-app purchase dialog. It's not bad. We don't have a ton of really crazy things on there. It's not super crowded. There's nothing below the fold. You don't have to scroll to get anything. Um, now, I don't know why I would spend $60 as opposed to $1. I mean, I suppose I could do the math in my head and figure that out. Um, and I'm not really sure what the two things in the bottom right are. But I mean, it's not, it's not bad. Better, however, would be if you made one of the most obvious things in your game, in your in-app purchase dialog, the value that they get for spending more money. That way, users can buy value. Obviously, the users don't, you don't want to have to depend on your user being able to do math in their head to sell higher price items. You want them to recognize, I get 100% more if I spend $50 than if I spend $1. I like 100% more. I'm going to go ahead and get the 100% more. Now I've got a really strong reason to get that. Now, another reason I like this in-app purchase dialog box is because it doesn't mix apples and oranges. This is all a soft currency dialogue. If I want to get something else, like maybe hard currency items, I can just go up there and select the silver point store, the silver piece store, uh, to get a different kind of item. Very clear, not confusing, and the value is super crisp. Now, when I was looking at putting price points in my first app, I mean, I remember going to college. I remember taking an economics course. You guys took economics in college? Yeah, and you remember the supply-demand curve, right? If you want to sell more stuff, you decrease the price and you'll sell more things. I wanted to do that, so I put a lot of my prices at 99 cents and $1.99, apparently just like the rest of us did. The orange bars you see there are the percentage of our catalogs at a certain price point. What the other color is, is where we get most of our revenue, and it's not terribly balanced. The top 50 get that they look at where their money is coming from and they balance their catalog so that it's a little more even. Now, what we've learned from this investigation is that if you want to be able to offer differentiated things to your customers and receive more orders because your <coughs> offers are better targeted, have a bigger selection. After they buy something, teach them how to use it and increase the number of reorders that you get. If you want to be able to sell more of the higher priced items, or even items at all, make sure you really do a good job of highlighting the value of what you get when you purchase the higher price item. Again, I want to wrap this up by saying differentiate your IAP catalog. If you're showing your day 30 user the same in-app purchase items as you're showing your day one user, you're doing that customer a disservice. If they've been with you for 30 days, they love your app. Really, you are going to lose about 80% of your users after day seven. So if you've got someone at day 30, they're a huge fan of yours. Give them something additional. So give them some additional value, a higher price item, to get more of what they love about your game. Absolutely do that. Now let's take a look at what the top 50 did differently than the rest of us to get more engagement. Well, the first thing is, is they make it really easy to get into the game and to start playing. I mean, Flappy Birds is a great, if unintentional, example. When you start Flappy Birds, you just tap play and you start going. When a game ends, you tap play and you keep playing. It's insanely easy to pick up that app and start playing a game. This 
is as opposed to one of my favorite Connect 4 games. There was a, a splash screen which had a main menu and settings button on it, okay, main menu. Then you had start a new game, start a saved game, new game. And then you'd have to go through an options list of you know, one person versus computer. You'd have all these different options, what color you wanted to be, if you wanted to go first. Good grief, by the time I finally started playing a game, I was already about 15 taps into the game. That's hard to get into. And it's not worth doing that if I've only got a few minutes in line somewhere. So it was really a barrier to entry for multiple sessions in a day. Don't do that. Another thing that is often a barrier to use is having to redo work. I hate having to redo work. I hated it as a student. Hate it as a game player. Imagine if you're at home playing a game and you get to level 14 on your tablet. You're in line at the store, you take out your phone, you open up the app, and you start on level zero again. How many of you would actually replay those 14 levels on your phone? Now, probably not a lot of us. We'd probably go back to a game that was really easy to start and really easy to get going quickly. Now, I'm showing you a, a picture of um, uh, Amazon's Game Circle, which has ActiveSync. And what it makes sure that happens is when they open that app on the phone, they start at level 14 right where they left off, which reduces friction to having additional sessions per day. So the top 50 get that making additional sessions per day gets more people in front of their IEP catalog more often and increases uh, some of those important numbers. <laughs> um, I love this picture. Game difficulty is super important. Um, if you're the little guy, you're going to play this game once, and you're going to be done, really done. If you're the big guy, um, maybe you want to play the game two or three times. But I mean, after your third time, it's just not fun anymore. And you start kind of feeling bad. And you just, it's just, it isn't engaging anymore. So what the top 50 do is they A, B test levels of difficulty. They test easier difficulties to see if they can keep more people in the game longer and encourage more sessions. But does that have an adverse impact on hard currency in-app purchase sales? Well, what if they make the game harder? Do they get more in-app uh, in purchase sales at the expense of user session length? With A-B testing, they can go ahead and find that sweet spot. So they're maximizing revenue and user engagement and session length. Super important to go ahead and test that. Don't guess. Make sure you do the A-B testing so that you know. Another really important thing is adapting social. Social is really important. To, you'll see it in more and more games. It's becoming to the point where you know, if people really like it, they'll tell their friends, they'll rank your game. Um, this is a, another example of the leaderboards and achievements from Game Circle. And leaderboards and achievements really are kind of the, the first entry point that you need. It's because, well, my son and I have this geography game that we play. And of course, I'm dad, I travel for a living. Of course, I'm going to beat him, right? So the first game we played, I won. Then I got a notice that he'd beaten my high score. OK, unacceptable. That's, that, that can't happen. I'm dad, I travel, I've got to beat him. So I opened up the game, and I played it until I beat him. All right, we're done. But he beat my high score again. So I kept opening that app watching their advertisements, generating money for that developer. I mean, this wasn't a fancy app. You guys could write this in a weekend. But I gave that app hours of usage it probably didn't otherwise deserve because of leaderboards and achievements. Consider whether you want that kind of effect in your app. Another thing that the top 50 do is they make it easy to buy. This is a Ninja Kiwi game. I love these guys. This is a tower defense game, uh, Balloons Tower Defense 5. You guys played this game? Love this. A bunch of balloons zoom through the maze, and uh, you've got to pop them with your monkeys throwing darts before they get out the bottom. Now, the problem is, sometimes these balloons can be pretty tough to pop. And if you get a whole bunch of balloons zipping towards the exit, and you've worked for a long time on this level, boy, wouldn't it be great if you could buy something now and get something that'll pop all those balloons? Great. So you click on something, and you can't buy anything. What's up with that? As a matter of fact, in this game, to buy something, you need to exit the game, go back to the main menu, go back into a store menu, find out which store you want to go into before you can purchase an item that you may be able to use in the game later. Ninja Kiwi figured out they didn't sell a whole lot of in-app purchase items this way. So in their next game, they made a change. Same tower defense concept, except we've got zombies instead of balloons. Notice the soft currency items on the left. But if you've got a horde of zombies just about to exit the maze, and you need to get something right now to stop them, 
we've got hard currency items over on the right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up there and I'm going to buy a nuclear hand grenade. Okay, maybe giving soldiers nuclear hand grenades wasn't the best idea, but you should see what they do to hordes of zombies. Man, this is great. I go up there, I tap on that, it pauses the game. For 99 cents, I can get three of them. It shows me how to use it. I drag one of my nuclear hand grenades onto the horde of zombies, and boom, no more zombies. Thank you for giving me what I needed, when I needed it, and making it super easy. As a matter of fact, games that made it super easy to buy things like that typically had a 75% higher uh, average revenue per paying user than, than games like the first Ninja Kiwi game that didn't. So what have we learned from this part of our study? Tweak your game difficulty and add social in order to maximize time and count of sessions. Make sure that you do um, integration into your game design. IAP isn't a bolt-on after you're done with your game. It should be included in your game decision making. And make sure you know, don't guess what you're doing. Make sure you do A-B testing to figure out what's gonna work best for your customers. Now, this is what we learned looking at what the top 50 do versus the rest of us. But we're fortunate enough today to have uh, Salim meet it with us, and he's gonna show us how Playtika uses the strategies that the top 50 use, and actually he's gonna share some strategies that they've learned on their own. Uh, Salim joins us from Playtika, a division of Caesars Interactive, and uh, take it away. Sure, uh, thanks Mike. So I'm Salim, um, actually based in Santa Monica. Uh, some of you may not have heard of Playtika, but as Mike said, we are a division of Caesars, uh, the interactive division. Uh, Caesars, uh, Playtika is actually top five grossing social uh, gaming company in the world, behind some of the big ones you've probably heard of, uh, the Candy Crush guys or Supercell. Um, we have some big flagship brands, World Series of Poker, in fact there was the final table yesterday, but these are the online games, Caesars Casino, Slotomania. I look after Bingo Blitz which, and Bingo Rush 2, which are bingo and slots. Uh, almost all of these games are three to four years old, so we've been doing this for quite a while. Um, almost all these games, actually all of these games are top grossing games, but I can tell you that it's hard work. It's hard work to get there, it's hard work to stay there. If you look at any other gaming companies, it's really hard once you have a hit to maintain the hit. So what I hope to do today is share some lessons that I've learned uh, in my years um, managing our uh, free-to-play casino apps, social casino apps. So there are two things I'm going to talk about. Uh, marketing, which is going to be all around the acquisition, retention, and engagement of the users. Uh, these were big challenges, big challenges every gaming company, every app faces. Um, and then the second thing, once you've acquired, retained, engaged those users, how do you monetize them? How do you continue to monetize them um, over the course of time? So those are the two main areas I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with marketing. So one of the big things is what's my ROI? How much can I spend acquiring users? And you have this issue. Um, there are lots of ways to acquire users, but this is the principal driver that is really within your control. So. Two questions we had is how much can we pay for users because what's our payback period? What's the ROI? Um, and then the second thing is how do we continue to grow our game? We want to grow our audience that come to our game every day, our DAU, our daily active users. I was fairly new to gaming when I came um, and was running Bingo Blitz three years ago. Um, so the first bit of knowledge that in talking to a lot of the big gaming companies was you have seven to 14 days to monetize your users. So you acquire them. Make sure you put offers in front of them and monetize them in seven to 14 days. This is the typical game arc. By about a month, users, uh, they get bored and they leave. Everyone looks at one day, five, seven day, 14, 30 day retention. We actually found something different. Um, we actually found that the acquisition of these users doesn't depend on monetizing them then within the seven to 14 days. As you see here, month one only accounts for six to 7% of the revenue of the user's lifetime. If you can acquire a user and retain them, month two is even more critical. These are 19 months of data. So actually, if you can acquire users, you can properly retain them and engage them, you actually have many bites at the apple to actually retain and monetize those users. So it actually means you can actually pay more for these users. Um, my last point there about the evergreen game and evergreen content, um, the social casino genre is an evergreen genre, but part of it, what makes it that way, is the content. 
We continue to release new content that keeps users coming back, keeps it fresh. So lots of games can apply that. It's not something specific just to our genre. Second point, as I said, so you're acquiring users. Okay, well, how do we? There were points in time where we're acquiring a ton of users, but our DAU wasn't going up. And we're trying to figure out, well, what's going on here? So we weren't sure. Black magic, we had no idea what was happening. Um, but again, the conventional wisdom was the DAUs are coming from recent acquisition. You're not retaining those current users. Uh, so just keep topping up the funnel, get more users in. This was actually a huge learning for us. Um, what actually happened, what we actually, when we dug into it, we looked at our composition of DAU. When did they install the game? Turns out that over a third of our users installed the game two years ago, when we look at our DAUs now. 60 to 80% come from not this year. So over a year, um, they've had the game installed. So what does this mean? Yes, acquisition, top of the funnel activity is important, but even more important is retention and reactivation. So those users, this is just another way to look at it, um, this is a metric we look at. So what I'm going to be doing is sharing with you sort of our best practices and metrics we look at. And we look at our DAU percentage of that cohort. What year did they install? You can also slice this by month. And then you start creating really interesting ways to look at your user base. Another metric, we talk about DAU. So your DAU is going up. Is that a good thing? Maybe, maybe not. We have a metric that we look at which measures the potency of our DAU. And what I mean by that is, what percentage of our daily active users have been payers in the past? This is as if you owned a retail store. Imagine if you see trunk sales all the time. Imagine if 100% of your users in that store were purchasers before. The likelihood is, when you put an offer out there, you're going to sell a lot more. So we want to see this metric going up into the right. We call it our paying active users, or our POW, which is the percentage of our DAU that have purchased in the game at some point in the past. It doesn't have to be that day. And what this allows us to do is we measure this on a, um, I think we've talked about this, where what day of the week do most of these POW come into the game? Um, who are these paying active users? When did they install? So we can start measuring what day of the week are good days for us to actually put offers in front of these players and into our game. So that was a real interesting metric that you know, we came around to, so hopefully that was useful. Uh, just a summary of what this first section on this marketing acquisition, retention, and engagement, retention does matter. It matters because it means you can pay more to acquire users, uh, you have many bites at the apple, um, and you can continue to drive revenue. So what it does, as I mentioned, is it means that your payback period is longer than you think. Um, and if you can continue to retain not just players, but those payers, that makes it even more potent, your user base. So, Really, marketing is really about understanding those users, making sure they come back, and retaining those payers and players. So this is probably one of the, I've given parts of this talk before, and I think some of our competitors came up to me afterwards and said, I would not have shared any of this data. So I'm sharing with you some things that uh, hasn't got me fired yet. So, <laughs> um, so there's some interesting things in here. And this is, again, these are the things, this is the paranoia I had, because, OK, now we have all these users. How do we monetize them? So the first thing I want to understand is who are our buyers? I'm trying to understand them to make sure they don't go away. And then the second piece here, which was one of the biggest things, everyone runs a sale, but we all know that running a sale could be dangerous. And I'll talk about why that is. Um, is, it, is it smart to run a sale? When should I run a sale? Um, if I run a sale, does that mean that users will only wait for a sale? Am I training them? So these are the types of things that I wanted to understand so that we could continue to grow revenue and not sacrifice revenue. So the first point, who are our buyers? Uh, this was one of the biggest, we all heard of the, we've all heard of the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of your buyers represent 80% of your revenues. Um, actually, the same thing with us. In fact, it's even more skewed. 20% of our buyers represent 90% of our revenue. This is one way I split the cohorts, high, medium, and low, um, based on their lifetime value. And so, what this highlights is there are 20% of our buyers who are super critical to making sure that we retain and keep engaged in the game. Now, that's a double-edged sword. We have this huge concentration of revenue with 20% of our buyers. So how do I deal with that paranoia of are they going to go away? These are that high and medium cohort 
This is a monthly um, count of those buyers. The way to minimize that concentration risk is to make sure you keep growing that cohort so you have more and more. So what you're doing is you're graduating buyers from the medium cohort to the high cohort, and even within the high cohort, you keep increasing the numbers. So again, increasing the numbers, that's a good thing, but there's one more metric below it that we look at, which is our play rate and our pay rate. So they may have been buyers in the past, but how often are they playing? How many sessions per month? And how often are they buying? So they may have purchased in the past, but maybe they haven't purchased for three or four months. So you want to see these numbers going up as well, because what this is is the sort of third order metric of their level of engagement, both from a playing standpoint and from a paying standpoint. And we look at this with each cohort over a 30, 60, and 90 day period. Hey, Salim, um, do you offer, do you make different offers to your medium spenders versus your high spenders? And how do you figure out which one's the right one? Sure. There are different ways we can cut it. So the answer is yes. Um, we definitely personalize offers. That's what we call it um, in-house. Even amongst the high spenders, based on their last purchase date, how long they've been in the game, their average transaction value, um, what they have and have not purchased, we have different currencies in the game. We have coins for slots, credits for bingos, power-ups, other elements. We have a subscription. We try to really put forth a personalized offer that makes it really compelling for them to buy, which not only would increase their frequency of transactions, but the revenue that they generate. So a lot of A-B testing involved and a lot of personalization. So I mentioned graduating buyers. I haven't talked about first-time buyers. At one point, before you could become a high spender, you have had to have made a purchase for the first time. So this is something we really focus on, our first-time buyers. And again, Mike, to that point, we really try to tailor that first-time purchase. And you've talked a little bit about it earlier, about how important it is to get that first-time purchase. Um, and then to graduate them along the way. But which we, what we really try to do is put something really compelling, not just to get the purchase, but really get something based on their play, uh, their play patterns and their behavior. So this is the part that, as I said, it took me a while to kind of get to, and I'll sort of share some of this with you. This is the thing that our, my competitor said. I wouldn't have shared this, but um, should I run a sale? So any retail store, if users know a sale is coming, they will stop buying and wait for the sale. So what you're actually doing are substituting revenue from your normal storefront to the sale days or your sales storefront. That's not exactly what we want to do with the sale. We want it, ideally, to attract new customers, increase conversion, drive overall revenue. So one of the metrics we look at and we continue to monitor is the percentage of our revenue coming from our normal storefront versus uh, when we run a sale or from the sales storefront. We do stagger sale dates for unpredicta uh, unpredictability so users can't time it. But it's less about being random and it's more about being um, very uh, deliberate with regards to other economic elements, which I'll talk about. So I also, as part of my job, I look after product, monetization, and uh, the game economy. So it's very much like running any economy. Uh, this is wallet, uh, which is wealth. You basically look at people's actual um, balances. So the best times to run a sale, we started looking at this, and again, this sounds really obvious. We looked at, but there's a few components in it, what are people's average credit balance by cohort, and when it's their lowest, or it's at the low end of their, um, uh, their sort of the dis distribution, that's the best time to run a sale. Okay, that might sound obvious, but the question is, how do you get people to that low end, and then what do you do once people buy? So content is really important here. You want to have great content before a sale so that people use up their wallet. And then you want to give them a great sale and follow that up with even better content, new content, that actually then gets them to spend it. Because what you don't want is people to buy it and then hoard it and keep it. They don't put it back into the economy. You want them to continue to do that. And that's really what's going to drive revenue. So that was a really critical understanding for us around currency balance. This is sort of the actual consumption part of the economic equation, which is the absorption or the velocity of money. Once they have that, how quickly do they use those spent credits? Which, you, again, you don't want as people to hoard it. What we found is during sale, those big spikes are sale days. And then the colors are uh, same day, next day, and within one week. And we see that ni over 95% of our currency that we inject into the economy on a sale day is absorbed within one week. This is a good thing. 
Um, there are days when there are sales when we don't see that same level of money velocity, and we know that the content wasn't quite right, or maybe the offer was too generous, and people really stocked up. Because then what we then see is then we see what we call a hangover. People shifted all their spend to the sale day, and they don't have it for the, the normal day. So we measure not only balances, but we measure the absorption of those new credits into the economy to make sure that we're doing a good job of taking them out. So I use the word hangover. I talk about sale hangovers all the time. These are actual numbers by month, with the top line being our highest revenue day for that month. Those are usually on sale days. What we don't want to see and we've seen this in some of our other apps, is high highs and low lows. So you have a sale and you have a great day, and then the next day everyone's like, I stocked up, I'm full, I'm not going to eat tomorrow, I'm not going to buy tomorrow. And really what that is, that's when you see this revenue substitution. So what we want to see is the average revenue growing up, which is the middle line, the blue line. The red line, what we want to see is that's the floor, that's our lowest day of the month. And if you see that increasing, what we're doing is we're tightening that variability, at least on the downside, which is super important. So if you're managing the economy correctly, you're not going to see the high highs and low lows. You'll just see the high highs and the average going up. And you'll see users after a sale consuming their credits and um, actually moving up in terms of their level of engagement and spend. So wrapping up the second section on monetization, if you remember, we talked about using analytics to understand who your buyers are. Um, what are what, who are those users? And once you, I talked about that concentra concentration risk of the 20% of our buyers representing 90% of our revenue. Ways to feel better about that is if you keep increasing that cohort size, you keep increasing the retention, the play rate, and the pay rate. And then, I'm, as I mentioned, the last two points are about the sale, optimal sale timing, when the currency that you're trying to put on sale is low, but really, content is what drives um, making sure that you're in the right position to run a sale and that you correctly absorb the credits coming out of the economy. So as I said, it's hard work. It's hard work getting there. It's hard work staying there. Uh, there's a lot of testing involved. But it does give you a clearer picture of what's going on. So this is the chart I share with my boss every month. So it looks pretty simple. He just cares about the top line, which is, all right, number of buyers are going up and conversion going up. And our average revenue per paying user, or our PPU, is also going up. So he's like, this is great. That was easy. But it takes a ton of work uh, underneath. And um, hopefully some of the lessons I shared with you are interesting and helpful. And I'll turn, with that, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Wonderful. Thank you. So if you remember just one thing, I want you to remember four things. Um, make sure you differentiate your offers so that your revenue can uh, appeal to short-term and long-term users. Do A-B testing so that you know, stop guessing, know what's going to be best when you do A-B testing. Design offers for your long-term non-paying customers to attract them and, and move a lot of that revenue to first-time players who've been in there for more than a day. And then like Salim finished on, make sure if you're gonna do a sale, avoid the hangover by offering really good content that will absorb that currency. I know that's a lot to take away, but it's really important stuff. To learn more about some of the APIs we've referenced, like the A-B testing API that Amazon offers, please go to developer.amazon.com slash API, where you can learn more about that. If you'd like to continue this conversation or ask more questions, you could reach us via our Twitter feeds, Mike F. Hines or Salim Mita um, up there. Go ahead, take a picture of that or write that down. One of the things that I'm really happy to do this afternoon, everyone in this room, this is it's like an Oprah Winfrey moment. I love it. <laughs> um, don't check under your chairs. We didn't actually put anything there. But everyone in the room today gets a free Amazon Fire phone. How about that? What I want you guys to do, thank you. And you thought you just came for the great content. So how this is going to work is you're going to pick up a card on your way out. Paul, raise your hand. Uh, these guys are going to be handing out cards uh, on your way out. Uh, and then you can go ahead and redeem them at the table in, uh, in the hall, one phone uh, per card. And um, we'll also be giving away Fire Phones to people who attend the other sessions 
listed below the, uh, the Fire Phone track sessions, uh, both on Thursday. So guys, thank you very much. And please go ahead and take the survey up here. If you like this information and you want us to do more of this information, please give us a great result on this survey. Thank you very much.